the thing I would point out is that um, there are bull markets and bear markets and uh, in basically any tradable instrument or commodity or uh, I consider gold to be a form of money. But what we're really talking about when we say, you know, gold is up, what we're talking about the dollar price of gold. And I view it as a cross exchange rate. People talk about the dollar, you know, the euro dollar exchange rate. Well, there's a dollar gold exchange rate and that's the dollar price of gold. Uh, so there's just alternative forms of money where people get to express a liquidity preference or uh, a credit preference, if you will, if you're concerned about the, um, if you're losing confidence in the dollar. But the first great bull market was um, 1971 to 1980. Uh, it lasted nine years and gold went up 2,200%. Um, the second great bull market was from uh, 1999 to 2011. Gold went up at just a little under 700 uh, percent. But um, in between, you had a bear market from 1980 to 1999. It's a long one, uh, you know, almost 20 years. Gold dropped from $800 to $250 at the bottom in 1999. And we had a second bear market starting in 2011. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Jim Rogers. Um, you know, Jim is one of the great commodity traders, uh, money managers of all times. And um, we were down in uh, Dominican Republic at the Casa de Campa. This is around 2014. But, you know, the, the bear market started in 2011, but it really fell off a cliff in 2013. So I said, Jim, you know, what, what do you think of gold? What are you doing? He goes, well, I own it, of course. And he said, I'm not selling but I'm not buying right here. And he said something that just hit me right between the eyes and it stayed with me. And, of course, he's right. He said, gold's going to the moon, but nothing goes to the moon without a 50% correction along the way. And if you look at the high in 2011, $1,900, you know, approximately, and where was the bottom of the of the bear market? It was $1,050 on December 16, 2015. Nobody knew it was the bottom at the time. But if you look at that drop down and you, you use $250 as your base, because you know you need a base. So you had uh, basically a uh, 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 the run from 250 to 1900 uh, was $1,750. Go down 50% from there, it's $825. 1900 minus 825 is 1075 and the bottom was 1050. So, so Jim totally stuck the landing. Like a 1050, like, okay, there's your 50% retracement. Now that's the bottom. Now it's going up and the sky's the limit. Well, we're not overheated at all. I've got gold at, uh, I would put it at fifteen thousand dollars an ounce before twenty twenty five. But as I point out, if you're going to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce, you gotta to get to three thousand, five thousand, and seven thousand first. So there's plenty of room to run, plenty of room for profits. But you know, when I say things like that, I want to be clear, there's a lot of analysis behind it. I don't just pull a big number out of the air and you know, for publicity because I could care less. But if you just took the average and there are a couple of ways to think about it. Just take the average of the two prior bull markets I mentioned. So 71 to 80, nine years, 2,200%, 99 to 2011, a 12-year bull market, um, about 700%. Just take the average. You don't have to go to the higher of the two or extrapolate. Just take the average of those two bull markets. You would say, okay, well, the, the next bull market is going to be a little over 10 years, and it's going to go up um, – it's going to go up 1,500%. So using that as your base, just take the average of the two. You say, all right, 10 years from 2015, that puts you up to 2025. And at, you know, 1,400%, it puts you at $15,000 an ounce off a 1050 base. So that's just, that's just history. But there are other ways to think about it. Now, um, you know, I don't know if there'll be a gold standard or not, but I do know that gold will move, the price of gold will move in the direction of where it would need to be if you're going to have a gold standard. And you know, I talked to Paul Volcker about this, and, and he agreed. You, um, uh, If you just took the money supply, so just take M, M1, which is you know, a pretty widely accepted definition of uh, money supply. Take it for the U.S., the ECB, U.K., Bank of Japan, and People's Bank of China. There are other entities you could include, but that's, that's, about, that's over 75% of global GDP right there. Uh, divide that number by the official goal, which is about 34,000 metric tons, a little bit less, you come to $15,000 an ounce. So uh, if, you're, if you're going to either have a gold standard or even use gold as a reference point for money, uh, if, you, if you need to restore confidence in the dollar, the implied non-deflationary price is $15,000 an ounce. So what I find interesting is that if you use the, just the history of the last two bull markets and average them or – if you use you know a rigorous calculation, what's the what's the implied non-deflationary price? 
Interestingly, they come out in the same place. I don't think they have to. They're two different methods, but they both point to $15,000 an ounce sometime over the next three or four years. If it is a moving target, the numbers I gave you are based on current levels, but if you keep printing money, you need a higher price to, if you want to reference gold and not cause deflation, which they don't, you're going to need a progressively higher price of gold. One thing people forget, um, you know, they tend they look at the dollar price in absolute dollars. So it went up $100 an ounce, or, you know, I expect before long it'll go up $1,000 an ounce a week. But each dollar increase is a smaller percentage increase. So people look at the dollar. It's real money. It's nice to make the money. But, you know, if you go from uh, $14,000 an ounce to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% increase. I mean, that's you can do that in a week. So so my point is it's still $1,000 an ounce, good for the holders. But the, the percentage increase gets smaller and smaller as the absolute dollar amount gets larger and larger. So $15,000 sounds like a big number from today's perspective. But as you go to 10, 11, 12, it gets to be a progressively smaller percentage increase and therefore more likely. You really – you need to see it logarithmically to see it, you know, a less hyperbolic curve. So logarith- logarithmically is the right way to think about it. But in dollar terms – the percentage increase gets to be pretty small at those levels. And uh, when I say $15,000 down, I don't think I'm stretching. I mean, could, could it be $25,000, $40,000? I mean, just take my, my monetary equivalent. If you use M2, and by the way, my when I said, when I used M1 and did that math, that's with 40% backing because historically 40% has been a high level of backing. If you take M2 at 100% backing, you get to 50000 an ounce in a heartbeat. My numbers, I think, are conservative. They could be much higher. But the thing I would point out is that the, the Fed dug a hole and they can't get out of it. And I said in, uh, you know, well, all along, but certainly, you know, 2014, 2015, et cetera, as they did the taper and then they did the liftoff and then they raised rates and all that. I said the Fed is trying to get out of this. They're trying to normalize the balance sheet, trying to normalize interest rates. But I also said they won't be able to do it. And that's exactly what happened in the fourth quarter of 2018 between October 1st and December um, uh, 24th. 2018, the stock market dropped 19%. It was one point away from a bear market at that stage. And then you had the Christmas Eve massacre. And that's when Jay Powell threw in the towel. He got religion. He said, okay, first he said, we're not going to raise rates anymore. Then he said, we're on pause. Then he said, we're actually going to cut rates. And then nine months later, he said, we're going to end quantitative tightening, which was reducing the balance, the, the, the money supply. And then in September uh, 2019, they started QE4, which is the that was before any of the, before the recession, before the depression, before the pandemic, they were already in QE4 and uh, cutting rates again. So th- they can't get out of it. Now it's worse. So they prove that the, the failure is manifest. They prove that they can't get out of it. Uh, and, what, and, and, and what can they do? By the way, on, on monetary theory, I mean, you say, what's the secret behind monetary? I think it's garbage, by the way, but you say, what's the secret behind it? Well, the secret behind it is if you can issue debt, and collect taxes in the money that you print, you can force people to accept the money because they need the money to pay their taxes. And if they don't pay the taxes, they end up in jail. Now you can, you can, you know, get extensions or, you know, do whatever. But at the end of the day, if you manifestly refuse to pay your taxes, they will come and, uh, and put you in jail. And, and the point is it relies on state power. It's really a neo-fascist concept. It relies on coercion, you know, the point of a gun jails and state power to enforce the confidence in money. Now that's, and they say that, I mean, I've, I've read Stephanie Kelton. She's the bright light. I mean, this goes back a long way, but I've met her, read her books and, and uh, her book, I should say, and her articles. Uh, but they're very explicit about that. Now I think that's completely wrong because there are so many workarounds and so many ways to get out from under that kind of state power, but they do rely on state power at the end of the day. So that's why it has this, this neo-fascist element. 